Listen in on a recent selection of Scientific American's 60 Second Science Podcasts. I'm podcast editor Steve Mursky. Feathers are not just for flight. They keep birds warm, become part of their nests, and help them attract mates. And for one Australian bird, feathers even help produce an important sound, an alarm. People had long noticed that these birds produced these loud whistles. Trevor Murray, a postdoctoral researcher at the Australian National University. My supervisor, Rob McGrath, in collaboration with uh, May Hingi, um, thought that they were used as an alarm. Uh, so they, they did some playbacks and they could show quite strongly that if you play back these sounds to other birds, uh, they flee straight away. Um, so what I was really interested in was following up on that research and finding out how they produce the sound, uh, whether it is actually a signal and whether it's a reliable signal. The team focused their experiment on specific feathers in the crested pigeon's wing. Uh, we were able to uh, target the eighth primary feather, which is unusually narrow. Uh, it's about half the width of the surrounding feathers. And then we also removed, um, on different sets of birds, we also removed those neighboring feathers, the ninth primary feather and the seventh primary feather. And we were able to see that the eighth primary feather, when it was missing, the high note had completely disappeared. So the eighth primary feather produced that high note, and the ninth primary feather, it turns out, actually produced the low note. And if the birds are fleeing from danger, they produce a louder and higher tempo whistle than they do during a normal takeoff. The study is in the journal Current Biology. Murray and his colleagues did another experiment where they used the recordings they made to observe the reactions of other crested pigeons. And from this experiment, we were able to see that the eighth primary feather, the unusual feather, was actually crucial for signaling alarm. When that eighth primary feather was missing, they very rarely responded. They almost never fled. Um, whereas when the neighboring feather that produces the other part of the sound, that ninth primary, um, they actually fled just as much as to normal alarms. So this shows us that this unusual primary feather is, is crucial for signaling alarm, and together that suggests that um, it has evolved to communicate um, with its flockmates. So that birds of a feather can flee together. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Annie Sneed. They're among the most amazing events of the wild world. Africa's thundering herds of wildebeest. And nothing will stop them now. The incredible migrating monarch butterflies. One of the great spectacles of nature. The captivating chorus of the Gulf Corvina. Wait, haven't heard of that last one? It's a true wildlife spectacle. The fish this loud, this many fish calling. Brad Arisman is a fisheries ecologist at the University of Texas at Austin. And to hear him tell it, the chatter of the Corvina fish belongs right up there with those other great spectacles. Every spring, he says, the fish migrate hundreds of miles to the northernmost reaches of the Sea of Cortez. That's the body of water between Baja, California, and mainland Mexico. And there, at the Colorado River Delta... It has this massive synchronous spawning with outgoing tides for about two to three days every other week for about three months. And during that time, it also makes this noise. produced by flexing muscles around its swim bladder. And it allows the swim bladder to reverberate, much like any sort of drum. That simultaneous drumming of hundreds of thousands or even millions of fish is extremely loud. It's louder than if you were, you know, a meter from the stage at a rock concert. In fact, Erisman and his colleague Timothy Rowell have found that Corvina chatter rivals the decibel levels produced by whales, loud enough even to damage the hearing of dolphins making it among the loudest underwater animal sounds on the planet. The aquatic cacophony is written up in the journal Biology Letters. But the sound is under attack by our teeth. Fried, baked, put it in tacos, or pretty much any way you can think of, you can make corvina. Which spells danger for the singing fish. It's heavily exploited, it's overfished, and we're really concerned about the fishery collapsing. But by spreading the word about the corvina's signature sound, Erisman hopes to keep the species and its song from going silent. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. Oh.
Bats are sophisticated communicators, and not just when they're in vampire form. I am Dracula. New research finds that Egyptian fruit bats actually have regional dialects, depending on the bat chatter that surrounds them as they grow up. The study's in the journal PLOS Biology. Among humans, one person's <coughs> is another one's Good night. while populations of bats also display group-specific vocalizations. But how do these vocal characteristics arise? Do they reflect innate genetic differences, or are they learned? And if bat accents are acquired, who are these furry flyers imitating? Their parents or their roost mates? To find out, Yossi Yuval at Tel Aviv University and his colleagues captured 15 pregnant fruit bats and divided them into three groups, each of which was housed in its own separate box. The mothers gave birth inside these boxes, and their babies, called pups, lived there for a full year. During that time, the researchers exposed the pups to a select symphony of bat sounds. Fruit bats in the wild are reared in colonies that contain dozens to thousands of individuals, so they're used to being surrounded by a cacophony of calls and other vocal communiques. For one of the boxes, Yuval and his team exposed the young batlings to a selection of squeaks that were biased toward the higher frequencies. Pups in the second box heard lower-pitched peeps. And the third box got a random sampling of fruit bat hits that was heavy on the mid-range frequencies but also included those at either end of the oral spectrum. And what we found is that they were influenced by the playback that they heard. Yossi Yuval. So the control uh, group was using a vocal repertoire that was identical to their mothers and identical to fruit bats uh, uh, in in the colony uh, here in Israel. But the two uh, manipulated groups were using different dialects. We actually were able to create three different groups of fruit bats with three different dialects in the lab. Of course, birds are famous for their songs, which the males learn from tutors, typically their dads. But Yuval says when it comes to vocal learning, bats march to a different drummer. Here we show that even though the pups were with their mothers and they were exposed to their mother's normal repertoire, they were still influenced by the background uh, vocalizations that they heard. Now this is probably extremely uh, reasonable in the case of bats, because bats roost in these caves with uh, uh, many hundreds of individuals. We believe that this process, which we call crowd vocal learning, because you learn from the entire crowd, is relevant um, for many other animals that live in crowded colonies. As the researchers note in their paper, this sort of social learning is sometimes called culture, even if you're living in a cave. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Karen Hopkin. In the most recent podcast, we discussed how baby bats learn their calls from all the other bats in their crowded colonies. And we mentioned in passing that songbirds usually get tutored directly from their dads. So how does that avian system work? In about 25 days, the father starts singing, in many cases, directly to the juvenile. David Metz, a geneticist at the University of California, San Francisco. That sort of is the onset of what's called the sensory phase of learning, where Uh, They incorporate information from their environment. What Metz and his team wanted to know was how much of a baby bird's future musicality is influenced by that tutoring, an environmental factor, and how much is written in their genes. So they studied Bengalese finches, which sing like this. The tempo of that song appears to vary according to a finch's genetics. So they tried training baby finches with different genetic tendencies, fast, medium, or slow singing, on a synthetic finch song made from a library of different types of song syllables. So these are sort of, they'd be tonal downward sweeps, so, you know, or sort of broadband noisy ones like shh. But when baby finches with different genetic backgrounds were trained on the resulting tune, the training didn't stick. Instead, the greatest predictor of their singing tempo was the way their fathers sang, which they'd never heard. So their genes seemed to be in charge. But then Metz flipped the experiment exposing genetically similar birds to actual live birds that sang fast, medium, or slow. And that live training appears to have been compelling enough to override the influence of the bird's genetics. So that genetically identical chicks sang tunes fast, medium, or slow, depending what their tutor sang. The results are in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The study suggests that the right kind of schooling, or environmental influences, 
might be able to overcome baked-in genetic influence on certain traits. And Metz says this push-pull of nature versus nurture might hold true for humans, too. You know, we're moving very rapidly into a period where genetic data is easier and easier to collect. And an understanding of these kinds of gene environment push-pull interactions and how they impact ultimate phenotypic outcomes is going to be important in understanding things like, you know, even, say, cancer susceptibility. Because that, too, has both genetic and environmental factors. But no word yet on whether the genetic influences of an off-tempo human father can be conquered with enough training. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. Killer whales, also called orcas, are like dolphins and belugas. They all have a wide vocal repertoire. But orcas also have unique dialects among different pods, which suggests the animals can learn new and unique sounds by imitating mom or another whale. Researchers tested that premise by asking a killer whale named Wiki to imitate novel sounds from another killer whale, like this. Or this. And then Wiki's trainers asked her to imitate them, speaking English. Here's how she did. Pretty impressive, especially because she's using her nasal passages to imitate sounds we make with our vocal cords. And a technical acoustic analysis of the original and imitated sounds showed that Wiki was doing a reliable job of mimicry, suggesting orcas do indeed possess the ability of vocal imitation. The study is in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B. So how long before Wiki's speaking fluent English? Well, this is not our goal. Study author Jose Zamorano Abramson, a comparative psychologist. We are focusing on one aspect of vocal language, which is the capacity for vocal imitation. Because the ability to imitate implies a way to transmit culture. And in doing so, preserve each orcapod's unique repertoire. Bye bye. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. Humans can recognize each other by voice alone. I sound different from other 60-second science reporters, for example. In fact, lots of non-human animals of all types use voices to distinguish familiar individuals, including frogs, fish, lemurs, and penguins. And that unique audio fingerprint extends to a sound you may have heard in the forest on occasion. The drumming of a woodpecker. Researchers recorded multiple drum rolls from 41 great spotted woodpeckers, colorful red, white, and black birds living in Polish forests. They then used audio software to analyze them, and they found that the length of the drum rolls and the spacing between beats varied enough from bird to bird to tell the woodpeckers apart by drumming alone. The studies in the journal PLOS One. The scientists say this fact might be useful to woodpeckers in identifying each other and to conservation biologists trying to tease one bird from another in a recording, for example, to count individuals in a given area. The bird's head banging could thus do away with that research headache. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. Intagliata.